Well, hi, uh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's P series, our peak performance seminar series, how to optimize your strength conditioning program. Uh, my name is Neil Prokop. I'm one of the sport performance specialists here at Sport Manitoba Performance. Uh, I'm alongside Jeff Wood, uh, also a sport performance specialist uh, here at Sport Manitoba Performance. So today we're going to talk a little bit about a strength conditioning program, why it's important, uh, what are some important considerations when we design a strength conditioning program, what should you look for in a program, and how you can, as an athlete, ensure you get the benefit of that strength conditioning program. So we'll talk briefly about some considerations to help you optimize your strength conditioning strength conditioning program. Um, and here's just a few few simple things that, that we're gonna talk about. So first of all, we're, we're gonna talk about increasing performance or enhancing athletic abilities, things like strength, power, stamina, change of direction, quickness, endurance, things like that. So that, those things that can help you jump higher, react quicker, be more explosive, um, adjust or get stuck out of stuck positions quicker. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about stabilization and efficiency. So not wasting movements or losing power, trying to stabilize, transferring force effectively through joints and your core and other parts of the body. And then neuromuscular efficiency. So properly recruiting muscles to produce force, concentric, uh, reduce force, eccentric, and dynamically stabilize isometric. And some other things we're gonna, gonna address through this talk about uh, controlling movements or body awareness and coordination. So building good habits, safe movements, reducing the likelihood of injury, handling the training loads that we're using, building a base to handle those high volumes of technical on court, on field, on ice training, um, cross training, periodization and fitness. So a way we can switch up our workouts, prevent burnout, give sport specific muscles a rest, and also a little bit about team building. A lot of questions we get from parents, athletes, and sometimes coaches is they wanna know uh, what should athletes be working on uh, and when should they uh, be working on these particular abilities. We'll often turn people uh, to the sport for life and the long-term development uh, pathway in sport and physical activity. Certainly one of our recommended resources, and you can find this uh, information at sportforlife.ca. Th these are some sensitive periods where athletes can work on particular uh, abilities and attributes. Uh, this is straight out of uh, this guideline, and this is going to fluctuate on when athletes hit their growth spurt, and everybody is a unique athlete. But these certainly address, and, and this guideline highlights some of these important abilities and where are some great times uh, to work on it. So you look at strength, right? Typically after somebody hits their growth spurt is when they can really uh, develop this ability skills such as you know movement uh, speed uh, you can work on on some of these skills before uh, somebody hits their peak height velocity or their growth spurt um, and no matter when athletes develop everybody follows a very similar pathway uh, which is this long-term development uh, pathway you're going to start with active start and, and fundamentals a lot of physical literacy right kind of learning those uh, basic movement patterns and important skills that are going to uh, allow you to progress as an athlete. Certainly at Sport Manitoba Performance, we typically are going to start seeing athletes around the train to train stage. The train to train is, is it's a critical stage in this uh, pathway. It's when athletes start the podium, podium pathway, uh, but this is where athletes need to commit to themselves um, and take that pathway towards developing their abilities, developing themselves. Um, and this is really kind of where their journey begins in high performance sport. In turn, and going through the podium pathway, you'll see that when athletes come to us, typically they're going to be in a, a learn to train kind of a phase where they, they've really not done a lot of strength conditioning and they want to learn how to do those things to improve their performance and as they as they grow and develop with us they'll get into 
uh, the train to train phase. And ultimately where we want to lead them to is getting into a higher level of competition, training to compete and training to win, which we still work with athletes in those capacities, but a lot of times they're those trained to win athletes or world-class competitors. So they're on national teams and things like that. And those are, those are athletes that we still work with, but lots of times they graduate up to go train in different provinces where there's national training centers and things like that, that they, they can work with. So these are, this, this is a very broad kind of area that, uh, that we start in and we try and work towards getting them into athletes into more national and international competitions as they grow and develop through with us. The important aspect of the train to train stage is just that it, there's such a window, uh, you see this middle point here, to have a rapid increase in your physical capacity as an athlete and really developing these abilities and these attributes that are gonna kind of push you towards uh, these higher, higher stages. So when we get into the train to train athletes, that, that particular part of the pathway, you're typically competing at a provincial level or you're in kind of the, the grouping that, that can compete at that provincial level and you're exposed to national or international competitions, often competing just locally or regionally in three or more sports. So early train to train phase generally specializing in in one sport getting on into the later train to train phase so lots of athletes will typically start to choose one sport to specialize in when they get into that kind of anywhere from 15 to 18 years old to pick one sport and try and specialize in that sport and then when they get into as they as they go through this phase they want to, we want to get them into more of a periodized or planned out training environment where, where we can work with their coaches and plan out their strength and conditioning along with their practice and competition schedule so we can hit different, different peaks, so to speak, at different times of the year when they have more major competitions. And as Jeff mentioned, when an athlete enters the train to train stage, strength and conditioning is really going to become uh, an important component of having a periodized and a planned training approach. So uh, the next section of this presentation is going to discuss a little bit more about understanding your strength and conditioning program and some of the abilities and attributes that get developed uh, during strength and conditioning. And so what exactly are athletic abilities? Uh, well, athletic abilities ultimately refer to the necessities uh, that you need as an athlete to carry out the efforts, the movements, uh, the tasks that are going to support your performance in the actual sport you're participating in. Athletic abilities can be grouped into physical, motor, tactical, and mental uh, abilities. And strength and conditioning predominantly assists with those first two, your physical and your motor, motor uh, abilities. We're gonna go through a few of these. Oftentimes, they can sometimes be grouped together, but as we go through some examples of athletic abilities, uh, try to consider uh, what are the most important abilities for my sport. Oftentimes, your sport is gonna have uh, multiple athletic abilities that uh, play a play an impact uh, on your performance and, and are gonna be the attributes of those abilities that you may wanna focus on during your strength and conditioning program. So the first page here, uh, oftentimes we think of stamina or endurance, and they often get grouped into kind of the same category, but they're a little bit different, and, and we'll go through a few of them on this page. Uh, so the first is aerobic power. So aerobic power refers to the ability to perform sustained high intensity and dynamic efforts. Uh, you can think of rowing for an example. Every time they stroke, uh, it needs to be at, at a higher intensity, uh, and they're going to go for uh, a particular distance uh, and it's almost like an all-out sprint to some extent uh, for that duration okay aerobic capacity a little bit different it's going to be the ability to sustain a dynamic effort over an extended period of time so it's going to be a little bit longer you can think of a sport like cycling they're maintaining more of a steady pace uh, but it's going to be maybe at a little bit of that lower intensity except you know when you're going up a hill or, or doing sprints 
you know, the aerobic energy system requires oxygen uh, and it utilizes oxygen, it takes a little bit longer to kind of tap into this energy system. Uh, your anaerobic systems are more of your explosive type, the energy system that provides immediate energy for these short explosive or high intensity dynamic efforts. So anaerobic power, an example could be uh, volleyball or beach volleyball, right? Where it's a rally, uh, you need to, uh, you know, get out of certain positions, you need to jump. And then finally, anaerobic capacity. So this is actually gonna refer to your ability to sustain a high intensity dynamic effort. Uh, for a little bit of a longer time, which is also predominantly fueled by the anaerobic energy system. If you can think of a shift in hockey, it's at that 45 second uh, length often, right? You're almost at an all out intensity. You haven't fully utilized your aerobic system during a shift. Uh, it's gonna you know, fit within this anaerobic uh, area. First, when we talk about some of these physical abilities, speed is, is one of those components. Uh, and it is the ability to rapidly move the body or part of the body or execute a series of movements in an all-out effort of very short duration. So you would look at something like sprinting or a quick attack in fencing or something along those lines where you've got to move the body quickly and, and get it going in a certain direction at top speed. And then speed endurance is the ability to sustain that effort at near maximal speed for as long as possible. So multiple repetitions, so something like a 100 meter or 50 meter sprint in swimming or running or, any, or something along those lines involves speed endurance. Next we have strength endurance or muscular endurance. And, and that's the ability to perform repeated muscle contractions at intensities below maximum strength. So something like rock climbing, um, where you've got to move and use your strength, but you also have to do it over, over a period of time. So there's fatigue that sets in, in something like that. And then we have power, which is the ability to perform a muscle contraction or overcome a resistance as fast as possible. So being explosive, hitting a tennis ball, hitting a volleyball, throwing a pitch, something along those lines. And then maximum strength is the highest level of tension generated by a muscle. So something would be like an Olympic lifter doing a clean and jerk for one repetition, that would be a sign of maximum strength, but also includes power or, or a one repetition maximum on a squat or a bench press or something like that. And then now we're gonna talk a little bit about motor abilities or biomotor, which basically is broken down into bio body motor movements. So, so it's your body movements, okay? So we'll talk about agility, which is the ability to execute movements, movements or change body position and direction quickly and effectively. And those movements are usually, agility is more reactionary. So you're react, reacting to another player on the field or where a ball is going or something along those lines. So there's a reaction component to agility. Then we have balance and flexibility. So balance being the ability to achieve and maintain stability. Flexibility, the ability to perform movements of around a joint or above a joint. So some of you might be asking, does strength conditioning actually work? Does it help and enhance these athletic abilities? And the answer is yes, it does. There's been uh, research and research and, and more and more studies um, you know, with youth athletes great paper came out with the National Strength and Conditioning Association. A well-designed resistance training program can enhance the muscular strength of children and adolescents beyond which is normally due to growth and development. We talked about how these learn to train and train to train stages, how there's that window of really enhancing these athletic abilities, you know, to get you to the next level and to enhance your performance in the sport. So, good strength conditioning program, it's going to enhance athletic abilities. And, and we view that, Jeff and I view that as a fact. And if you don't believe us, we certainly <laughs> encourage you to come into our performance center and work with us for, for a few months. And you're going to see, see these, uh, you know, the differences in your, in your performance. So that kind of sums up some of the important attributes and abilities that get developed uh, during a strength conditioning. 
we're going to now shift the session into discussing what are some important considerations when it comes to designing a strength conditioning program. What should you look for as an athlete or a coach or a parent uh, in a strength conditioning program when you're evaluating uh, different strength conditioning coaches or facilities? And how can you optimize the effectiveness of your SNC program as an athlete? And we're going to do this through not necessarily our top 10, but just 10 important considerations uh, to look for. And hopefully through uh, these 10 considerations, uh, we answer uh, a lot of these questions on the left hand side. Number one, we want to ensure that our program is balanced. So by balance, we, we really mean, are you working the front side of your body in the same amount as you're working the back side of your body, or left, right, etc. So when we do things like pushing movements, we have a bench press and we want to make sure we balance that out with a pulling movement like a row. Or we have a split squat for our quads and legs and deadlifts for our glutes and hamstrings. So we want to make sure that our program is balanced and we're hitting all areas of the body you know, one-to-one -one ratio. Um, to achieve the balance, sometimes you need to train the body in an unbalanced way. So in athletics, we tend to have, our, our sport tends to be a lot of times one-sided, one-side dominant. So for example, a golfer or a baseball player or a pitcher or something like that, they typically will plant their foot the same way, rotate their body the same way and not balance that out with other forms of, of training. So for example, if I'm a gol right-handed golfer, I would often swing my golf club maybe 150 times with practice swings and playing in a, in a golf game. How do I balance that out to make sure my body is balanced and staying healthy? We would often recommend doing more work on that on that left side to help balance out the right side through a strength conditioning program. Into talking about the different muscles that we use in a sport, well, we, we often will see some imbalances that cause some postural issues. So for example, if we look at, um, look at the picture on the screen, you're gonna see that this model, the head is forward, the shoulders and upper back are rounded and which causes them to have some weak or inhibited deep neck flexors and lower traps and serratus muscles and opposingly then they're going to have some more tight or facilitated muscles in their upper traps and their pec, pec muscles. So this, this can happen throughout the body in a variety of ways. Could be the upper cross syndrome, which is the one that's got the upper back and neck issues, or it could be a lower cross syndrome where it's in the hips and pelvis, lower back abdominal area. What we want in order to get good posture, so the picture on your left where things are lined up nicely and the body looks pretty balanced, good alignment, which is going to lead to better movement and safer movements. Whereas if you have a posture that's more similar to the, the model on the right, you're going to see that the posture is not that good and therefore movement's not going to be as efficient because your body is not able to, not able to move properly because it's not in proper alignment. When a muscle contracts, the opposite muscle needs to relax. So if, if we're trying to contract our lower traps or serratus muscles and the pectoral, pectoralis muscles are tight, then they're not gonna be able to relax very well. And then we're gonna get movement that's not efficient. So, and it's just gonna to lead to poorer posture over time, right? So. When we get into the nervous system, we want to have efficiency with, within that system. So during movement, muscles that contract, muscles that relax, and muscles that dynamically stabilize. So you need muscles to also stabilize the body to make movement efficient at other, other joints. So 12 basic movements for resistance training. 
and these exercises can fall into multiple categories. We have a hip hinge, which would be something like a deadlift, which is hip dominant. We have knee dominant, which would be something more squatting, right? Vertical push, which is pushing directly up in the air, vertical pull, right? So vertical push would be like an overhead press. A vertical pull would be something like a chin up. A horizontal push would be like a bench press and a horizontal pull would be a row or an inverted row or something along those lines. We have rotational and diagonal movements, which would be more core torso type movements, but also rotation occurs at your hips and your shoulders. Um, Anti-rotation or preventing rotation from happening. Anti-flexion, which would be basically holding a plank and holding that position without letting your body flex forward and like a sit up. Anti-extension, again, trying to prevent any extension from happening and anti-lateral flexion. So side bending, trying to prevent side bending from happening. And that's number one, ensure your program is balanced. So number two, beware of asymmetries and try to find ways to incorporate split stances or single limb and dumbbell work. Jeff had mentioned how it's really important to have balance with left and right sides, front and back. You know, a lot of sports to some extent are one side dominant. So sport itself is full of asymmetries. You know, you think of fencers, they're, they're typically you know, externally rotated and you know, in a certain stance and they don't really switch their footing you know, soccer, tennis, right? Uh, kicking with one side, hitting the ball with one side. Uh, sport is full of asymmetries, but the weight room really doesn't, doesn't have to be. Having an asymmetry, it might increase your risk of injury. Uh, just a few studies, uh, you know, there's a functional movement screen, a uh, series of seven tests. Purpose uh, of the FMS is to try to, you know, identify some areas of concerns. If there's uh, extreme muscle imbalances or asymmetries between between the limbs, you know, a few studies here, one with uh, division two rowers, volleyball players and soccer uh, players found that, you know, you're at double the chances of getting, uh, getting injured. Australian football players, two times the risk uh, as well. So, I mean, we, we will sometimes do the FMS with our athletes and, you know, it's kind of like if you can, you know, you think of the analogy of driving a car. Uh, if you, uh, I don't know how many of you on this call can drive the car, but uh, if you if you hear a noise, you know, in, in the car, or something underneath the hood that doesn't sound right, you just you don't go ahead and turn the radio up and, and kind of ignore it. You know, you try to you try to address it. So that's the idea of screening and, and the FMS screen in particular, uh, trying to identify uh, some asymmetries before you know the season starts and before you start having larger training loads. Um, so that you're in a, in a safer position. Here it's, it's the Y balance test and uh, just being able to reach forward uh, with one leg and kind of that discrepancy can identify some possible areas of concern. A few other ones, uh, the rate of muscle injury was significantly increased in subjects with untreated strength imbalances. So not only um, you know, movement or range of motion asymmetries, but also strength imbalances can sometimes contribute to, to injury. This one was a 4.5 times increase in, in injury risk. A multi, multi-sport study, there was a trend of higher injury rates to be associated with knee flexor or hip stents, extensor imbalances of 15% of more on either side of the ability. So, um, you know, is your anterior side or your quads uh, more dominant than, than your hamstrings? And, and that imbalance, uh, Jeff just, you know, spent Spent a few slides talking on the importance of having muscle balance in your program between front, front or anterior and posterior sides. Um, you know, here's a study that kind of shows that 15% difference in strength can be can be problematic. You know, sometimes uh, this study was with skiers. It showed that it's not always necessarily strength uh, with asymmetries, but sensor motor control. It might just be the ability to engage the muscles and and stability on on different sides of the body could be a mechanism for lower limb injury risk in, in downhill skiers. Another recommendation, basically when return to play decisions are made, so if you're coming off a serious uh, injury, maybe it's an ACL injury or, or something to a lower limb, they kind of recommend that, uh, or this study in particular recommended that athletes should try to get their injured limb up to, you know, 
within 10% of their uninjured limbs so that asymmetry between left and right sides uh, is less than 10%. Okay, so as I mentioned, even if sport is full of asymmetries, one of the benefits of strength conditioning and of the weight room uh, is that the weight room shouldn't be or doesn't have to be. Here are just a few examples of lower limb uh, exercises that only use a single leg, right? So you can do a strength, you can do stability. And, and the important thing when you're doing single leg exercises really is to have, have good alignment. So this bottom right here, your single leg goblet squat, you know, it's important. Sometimes you want to do it in front of the mirror and you want to make sure your, your knee has good uh, alignment. Uh, here are some examples of some upper body uh, single limb exercises, right? Same idea. You know, between right and left sides, really, really important. Certainly as an athlete, if you notice that you're developing asymmetries or, you know, if you, if you are getting injured and you want to um, try to resolve some of these asymmetries, if you're doing some of these screens and you notice, you know, you have dominant sides over the other, if it's a strength, uh, strength issue, maybe certainly, certainly reach out to us. If it's a, uh, because of an underlying injury, the Sport Manitoba Clinic is going to be a great, great resource for you. Uh, so that's, that's number two, beware of your asymmetries and incorporate split stances, single limb work or dumbbell work. Okay, so next we're gonna talk a little bit about following appropriate reps, sets and tempos in your, in your exercise program. So if we look at something like a bench press where we're doing two sets of 15 reps at a tempo of 2 one, one which two, 2 is the lowering phase, the middle number 1 is a pause, and the last number 1 there is the lifting phase. So if you do that and do a little bit of, little bit of quick math, 15 reps, 4 seconds of per rep is 60 seconds of time under tension that the muscle is under. If we move to a 4 sets of 5 reps, at an eight second tempo, so five times eight is 40 seconds. This is more of a strength kind of a program where we're doing heavier loads, fewer reps, and the tempo under heavy loads tends to be a little bit slower. So we're, try, we're basically trying to move, move that weight relatively quickly, but because it's heavier, it's harder to do. And then three sets of eight reps is just kind of more of a basic starter strength and conditioning kind of a kind of a program where you go into if you look at the tempo there eight reps at a two second lower one second pause and explosive lift so there's a little bit of little bit of speed required there there's a, even a little bit of endurance in that again you're talking about three to four seconds per rep at eight reps that's only 24 to 32 seconds of tension on the muscle. So looking at these different things, we take those into account when we're developing a program. So what is our goal? If our goal is muscular endurance and stability, then, then we program a different way. If it's hypertrophy or building muscle, then we have to look at, at again, at a different, different method of trying to do that. And that, that kind of program is, the muscle under tension for a decent amount of time, minimizing rest and kind of maximizing fatigue of the muscle to help it grow. When we work on maximum strength, those things are signified by heavier loads, longer rest periods. So every set that we do and every rep that we do, we're getting the most out of our body. And, and when we move into things like power, power, we take usually are using sub maximal loads or lighter loads lots of times and trying to move those move the body or move that bar or medicine ball or whatever it is as fast as possible so we're trying to be really explosive in those those types of settings so if you look at the at the, the picture here where we have different phases you'll look at uh, stabilization as being the base or the foundation, right? So we want to build some endurance, 
teach the body how to stabilize and, and be stronger and more stable. And then we build on that by building into strength endurance. So kind of getting in between the endurance and the strength part where it's moderate sets and reps and trying to build, build off that base of stabilization. And then we move into things like hypertrophy where we're trying to build muscle then maximum strength. And then you can see that the foundation, if you don't have that foundation, you jump right in, let's say you jump into right into training power and you reverse what this little step looks like, you're gonna be less likely to be able to produce power and strength because you didn't build that base first. So when we look at things like muscular endurance and stability, the intensity is is a little bit lower, so we're doing things in you know up to fifty percent of our maximum strength or one repetition maximum, two to three sets of fifteen to twenty repetitions, and the tempos are going to be our eccentric phase are going to be two to three seconds to lower, our concentric phase will be one to two seconds to lift. Recovery between sets can range anywhere from thirty seconds to two minutes and we're gonna do two to four training sessions per week. Moving into hypertrophy, so this is where we're trying to build muscle. The intensity goes higher, so we work in more of a 60 to 80% of our one repetition maximum. We work in three to six sets and six to 15 repetitions, and our tempos are gonna be, you know, three to four seconds to lower, two to three seconds to lift, Recovery between sets is going gonna, is gonna to range a little bit. And again, what we're trying to do when we're trying to build muscle is we're trying to fatigue that muscle and then fatigue it over and over with each, each, each additional set. So you're going to have a little bit of recovery time, but we're not going to let that recovery time get too long because we want to kind of get some growth hormone released within the body and, and if you let that let that happen your rest last too long then then that benefit goes away a little bit okay and we're looking at training sessions of two to three per week muscle group okay relative maximal strength so relative maximal strength is in relation to your body weight when we when we look at this, we've got the intensity is very high. We're in 85 to 100 percent of our one repetition maximum. We're kind of working in five to 12 sets, and then our reps are anywhere from one to five repetitions. Tempos are going to range a little bit here, where we can do as much as four to five seconds on our lowering phase, two to five seconds on our, our lifting phase. And even sometimes we, we go into one second lifting phases here where we're trying to really produce a lot of force in a short period of time to really work on our strength. And then training sessions per week, gonna be anywhere from two to three, and recovery between sets are gonna be three to five minutes. So we're taking longer rest intervals between our sets because we wanna to, to give 100% effort on each set and if and use as much weight as we can so when we work in this kind of a program you're going to see anywhere from three to five minutes rest and we want to maintain from set one to set five or set one to set six the same amount of reps or the same amount of load with those reps on on each set so next we're going to talk about power and this there's a couple different ways that you can look at power in terms of the intensity if we worked in a smaller 30 to 40 percent of our one repetition maximum then we would do movements a lot quicker they would be in, and for more repetitions when we get into 60 to 80 percent of our one repetition maximum we're really working on explosiveness and and trying to trying to get as much power and produce as much power as we can within, within each repetition. We're typically working within three to 10 sets and three to six repetitions per set for those exercises. And our eccentric phase could be anywhere from really one to four seconds, but our concentric phases are typically, which is where we're, we're actually gonna throw that 
throw that medicine ball or jump or whatever it is, those phases are gonna take less than a second. So we wanna be really quick and explosive with those movements. And then, you know, our training sessions per week are gonna be two to five. So it really depends on what we're working on here. And our recovery between sets during, that, during those workouts is gonna be really anywhere from three to eight minutes, but lots of times if we look at, look at it, let's say for example, we're doing a series of, of jumps, right? So let's, we'll use a high hurdle, high hurdle jumps, for example. If we did five high hurdle jumps in a row, it would take about five seconds to do that. And our work to rest ratios when we're trying to produce power, it can be anywhere from, you know, one to eight, or one to 15. So if it took five seconds for us to do a, a set of five high hurdle jumps, we would then, if we took a minute of rest, you'd be working in almost a one to 20 kind of, kind of work to rest ratio, which is, a, which is a lot of rest, which is good, right? We need to rest because we want to be explosive and powerful on each, each set. Okay, so just to review some key words from each of those different, uh, different areas. So muscular endurance, stability, high reps, low intensity, um, hypertrophy or muscle building, variety, volume, and loading time or time under tension is really important. Uh, relative maximum strength, we're looking at things like higher loads, lower volume, so lower sets, lower reps, for example, and good recovery. And then power, we're looking at things like acceleration, low volume, complete recovery, explosiveness, things like that. Number three, again, we wanna ensure you follow appropriate reps, sets, and tempos for your goal or your program at that time. Moving on to number four, uh, Jeff mentioned the importance of recovery. And that's our number four, to not only follow the rep sets and tempo, but to also make sure that we're recovering uh, between our sets and between our workouts. Okay, so we won't talk too much about recovery between workouts. We can, we can talk for ages on sleep and nutrition as well, but uh, we'll focus a little bit on between sets. And I think recovery, it's really important to understand why your body uh, needs recovery and how it relates uh, to energy systems. And talked a little bit about some of these athletic abilities, but your three energy systems are gonna be your anaerobic elactic, your anaerobic lactic, and your aerobic system. And these energy systems produce this molecule called ATP uh, at the bottom, and your body can only store uh, so much of it. And, and these energy systems supply energy for a specific time period. So uh, your anaerobic alactic, you can see it, it doesn't require or doesn't use oxygen. These are your sprints, your ex explosive movements. The seconds, if you were to be doing running, you know, it's, it's essentially your sprint is going to fully utilize uh, your anaerobic alactic system. Uh, your anaerobic lactic also doesn't use oxygen. It takes a little bit longer to kick in around that minute mark and it'll go on to kind of two, three minutes. Uh, and then your aerobic system will finally take over. Any event that is longer in duration is gonna utilize almost, well, primarily your, your aerobic energy system. Okay, so just to summarize, think anaerobic alactic, short duration, you know, eight to 10 seconds, like a 10 meter sprinter, really explosive type movements, anaerobic lactic, medium duration, one to two minutes, just kind of extending a little bit longer, but. 400 meter swimmer for, would be an example, and your aerobic system is gonna be long duration, basically unlimited time. Anytime you're doing a marathon or you're a cyclist, you're gonna be using that aerobic system. Okay, and this is a good summary. Okay, so important within each of these systems is to understand the peak power. So it's gonna be the amount of energy that that system can produce per unit of time. Your capacity is the total amount of energy that a system can produce. And your critical duration or your endurance is the length of time for which that system's peak power can be sustained. So going back to another benefit of strength and conditioning, it increases all of these attributes. It increases your capacity and your peak power. It means your 
anaerobic elactic system or your explosive system, uh, you can be more powerful and it can actually last a little bit longer. You can extend that past that zero to six seconds. Maybe it gets, uh, maybe you're able to exercise at a higher intensity for, for a little bit longer. And, and if you do that, you're gonna enhance your performance. So if we can shift everything, if we can shift this green to the right, just allows us to be at um, you know, a higher intensity for longer time, which is gonna increase uh, our performance. So coming back, when we think, Jeff just mentioned, he was talking about power and, and explosiveness. This is why rest is so important. When you look at that anaerobic elactic and the ability to replenish that ATP molecule that's required for muscular contraction, you can see how different restorations, how much time is required to get that replenishment back up and, and top back up. So 30 seconds, you know, you're at kind of 50%, two to eight minutes, you're almost creeping back up to that 100% and you're gonna be fully ready to do that, that next rep. And a lot of times in order for, for athletes to improve their top end speed, they need to train at top end speed as well. So. It's just, a, again, an, an important chart that shows how your work to rest ratio is actually going to affect which energy system you're utilizing. And if you're trying to train for speed and power and explosiveness and you want to utilize that alactic system, you need to make sure you're resting between your, your sets and, and you're following your program. Too often, we sometimes see athletes jumping from one exercise to the another. And that's, you know, when we're working on on speed recovery, recovery is important because we want to train that right energy system. On the opposite or on the flip side, uh, if you want to, you know, work on your aerobic system a little bit more, then you want to shorten that, uh, that work to rest uh, ratio a little bit more. Every sport is unique in which energy system it utilizes and how much recovery might depend on the energy systems that are most utilized in your sport. So this is just a quick chart, basketball and hockey. You know, they're about 50 to 60% your anaerobic alactic with explosive movements, but they're also going to have a bit of an aerobic component uh, as well. You know, a sport like running, predominantly aerobic, you know, a sport like rowing, again, predominantly aerobic, something like a golf swing, it's anaerobic alactic, necessarily need to train your aerobic system. Uh, and I should mention as well, something like a golf swing, when you see, you know, it happens in a split second, so you're not going to need three to eight minutes, right? Recovery between, between golf swings. But if you think of that, that work to rest ratio that we just went on the previous page, you're not going to just keep, keep hammering away uh, golf swings, you know, on a driving range. You're going to, you're going to take some time, especially if you're working on the technical aspects of the swing, you know, you're going to make sure you rest and maybe you do a few swings and, and take a bit of a break just so you're technically sharp. So really important when you're working on speed or technique to make sure you're in a recovered state. So number four, right? Allow, allow for recovery. We won't talk too much today about how to recover between workouts, but there are some guides that Sport Manitoba Performance puts out when it comes to sleep and nutrition. And we're planning on talking about some of these topics a little bit later in our P-series. Okay, so next we're going to talk about mobility. So number five, incorporate mobility, activation, endurance. Uh, into your program. So you'll see that in some of these videos, they're, they're really related to improving mobility and range of motion at different joints. So within our training programs, we incorporate a lot of these drills. And when it comes to certain, every sport's a little bit different, which muscles get tight and whatnot, but, but we wanna have kind of a total body approach to this. So when we move into our next slide and we look at hockey players or cyclists uh, who are almost constantly in a hip flex position, they tend to have issues that go on within their, their groins, their hip flexors, their lower back muscles because they're always in a, in a kind of a shortened, tightened state. So we need to we need to create some mobility programs that are geared towards that. Whereas with a pitcher or a swimmer or a volleyball player, a lot of, uh, a lot of mobility drills and exercises are geared towards the shoulder and the thoracic spine and things like that. When we get into this, we want to really think about taking those 
tighter, more facilitated muscles and being able to turn them off a little bit and, and have them get relaxed so we can actually create more balance within our body. So for example, the shoulder has 17 different muscles attached to this, the shoulder blade of the scapula. And in that, there's a lot of also nerves and things like that, that, that attach and run through and underneath bones and, and those types of things. So it's pretty complex. And we, as we go through that, we want to provide athletes with exercises that can help kind of create that movement and mobility, but also strength and, and stability at the same time. So, so some certain sports are going to have pretty loose shoulders where they get a lot of rotation out of them. And sometimes we have to actually tighten those areas up a little bit so, so they don't get as much range of motion and things are more stable. Um, when we get in, there's some, you know, a lot of different studies related to volleyball overhead athletes where a mobility impairment or muscle imbalance or weakness cause some asymmetries and injury, therefore injuries in, in the elite athletes. So same thing with swimmers, you know, you've got 2,500 shoulder rotations per day in a swimming session. There's going to be a lot of different things that can happen as a result of that, whether it's uh, some impairments that might happen include reduced endurance, your coordination, or you get a weakness in those shoulder muscles, a lack of stability, poor posture, lack of core stability, altered shoulder and spinal mobility. So a lot of different things can happen as a result of the sports that we compete in and train for. So part of the training process is to help balance that out. We can do that through strength training, but we can also do that through mobility work as well. So mobility refers to the amount of usable motion that one possesses. So it's a combination of flexibility, which is more of a passive range of motion, stability, having the strength to be in those ranges of motion and hold them, and strength. So being able to produce strength at those extreme ranges as well. So as I said before, a passive just refers to the angles or ranges of motion that are obtained through passive means. So someone pushing on your leg or push moving into an immovable object that can take you into a, a, your end range of motion. Active range of motion refers to those joint angles we can get into on our own. So for example, if you look at, uh, you can see kind of in the background there, person pushing on the straight leg of of the person lying on the ground, that would be passive. Act, an active version of that would be not having someone push on your leg, but actually trying to get into that position on your own, pulling your leg into that straight leg lift position. So you look at some of the videos that we have going on here, they incorporate, you know, the videos in the middle and on the right, incorporate some hip rotation and spine rotation and taking through taking those joints through that their full range of motion and incorporating some some other holds and things like that and the one on the left is more of a shoulder strengthening mobility exercise um, where we're trying to get as much range out of that shoulder and, and sca scapula and thoracic spine as we can um, but doing it under a little bit of load and, and trying to challenge it through hovering over an object. So you can look at, uh, for more information on, you know, functional range conditioning, or these guys have a series of different certifications that help people with individual mobility assessment and release exercises. Some of them are meant for practitioners like 
chiropractors and physiotherapists and things like that. Whereas the functional range conditioning certification is for really coaches, strength coaches. And so they have a variety of different certifications. They have a, what's called a kin stretch certification. You can actually do a group class in, in these types of exercises. We incorporate mobility, activation, and endurance within our training programs. Number six, warm up with intent. Certainly a way to optimize uh, your strength conditioning program is to get a good warm up, and, and oftentimes that transition from your actual warm up into your training session. Your training session ultimately starts from, from the moment uh, you step in that weight room or in the strength conditioning room. How we do warm ups here at the center, is we follow what's referred to as the ramp protocol. When athletes come in, they're gonna raise their heart rate. It's gonna help increase your muscle temperature. Um, activate okay so you're going to start moving like you do in your sport or in the, in the case of a strength conditioning you're going to actually try and uh, incorporate and activate activate uh, the areas of the body that you're going to utilize uh, during your training session if you're going to have a predominantly you know lower body workout all this these high knees and these pop float skip type movements you know are going to be important for a training session to come if you know if you're going to do upper body it doesn't make sense to just do a lower body uh, warm-up Okay, uh, mobility, we often kind of group activate and mo mobility a little bit together, uh, but just mobilize. So taking the body through the range of motion it's gonna face. So when you start moving like you do in your sport, so A and M can sometimes be grouped together a little bit, but uh, uh, we usually still do it in this order. Um, and then finally, P stands for potentiate, where you're preparing to perform and where you're actually getting ready uh, for practice and competition. So you can see Davis here is, uh, Doing, doing what we refer to as snap downs, okay? Single leg snap downs, preparing the body uh, for plyometrics and for jumps, and just trying to, uh, you know, kind of kind of get the body ready for, for these type of actions where they're gonna be at a little bit more of a higher intensity. We use an online program, we use our team builder program, and, and just to give athletes a bit of uh, what it looks like on our back end, um, we categorize our warm up and, and athletes that, that are training with us now. When they come in, they're going to see their warm up is usually in, in this type of format. So we have a variety of uh, raise components, uh, but oftentimes it's just general cardio. So you can think of jogging, treadmill, skipping, cycling. Uh, we have activation, you can see mobility component as well. And then potentiation, right, is our focus, especially when we do our um, plyometrics or change of direction type stuff. Is it going to be lateral movements? Are they going to be lateral jumps? Are we going to be doing more, uh, more things in that sagittal plane or the forward back? So we try to create a warm up that really replicates what the uh, athlete is going to face in their training session. So you can think we often use the analogy as well. If you're about to start a competition, uh, do you want that transition to be like stepping off a curb uh, or like a cliff? And, and in competition, you wouldn't want to just get thrown right into something, right? You'd like to, you'd like to get a warm up and, and like to, uh, you know, kind of graduate into that. Same thing with your training session, your strength and conditioning. Um, you know, athletes can stress the importance of, um, you know, taking the time to go through a thorough warm up and following that ramp protocol of raising your heart rate, activating and mobilizing those muscle groups, and then actually preparing it and getting your body ready for what's about to come uh, in your training session. The other stat we, we really try to, uh, you know, preach with athletes and coaches is that if you train five to six times per week, and it might not necessarily be in the strength room, it might also be in your field of play. If you do a 10 minute warm up, for example, it's actually equivalent to 48 hours of training over the course of the year. So warm ups do matter. And when you're doing dynamic stretches or, or single leg type stances and you're, you're required to hold positions, you know, it's really important that we have good alignment, that we take everything seriously and that we try to hold our balance. You know, technique matters, right? And if we don't take our warm-up seriously, you might actually start to develop bad habits. And when you think of 48 hours of training over the course of the year, it's a lot. And, and you know, habits can be made and broken a little bit uh, through your warm-up. So number six, uh, you know, warm up with intent. Okay, next we're gonna talk about proper progressions. So when we program, we wanna make sure that our, our program progresses an athlete from, uh, that like we talked about earlier in the steps from going from 
stabilization and muscular endurance to power, um, we want to incorporate those kind of concepts within our own training program. So just because you read or saw something online doesn't mean it's appropriate for you. Lots of people will jump on, see this program, and all of a sudden they're, they're doing this program and they think that it's, it's great because it'll help them improve their vertical jump, for example. Well, if, there's, if you've never strength trained before, never done a lot of jump training, jumping into a plyometric program uh, could be detrimental, could cause injuries. So you just want to make sure that you want to progress from basically simple to more complex, from lighter to, to more loads, from small to big, like things like that, right? So when we get into, we don't want to lose sight of the big picture and where you are and where you're headed. So we talked earlier about the sport for life, long-term athlete development model and, and the stabilization to strength to power kind of pyramid. And these, this is how we want to develop programs for athletes. So, and, and this, this can apply to anybody. It's not just about being an athlete, but in this case, when we're talking about athletes, um, it's important that we think about the big picture. If you're a 14 year old and you're a volleyball player and ultimately where you wanna be is playing professionally or playing in university or college or on the national team, you still got a long way to go before you, before you get there, you're old enough to be there and mature enough to be there. So we have to develop a program for you that progressively builds to get you there. And, and going through this whole process is basically, basically what we're looking to do. So in terms of progressing exercises, you're looking at doing things from a static and stable position to a static or in place and unstable position to a dynamic and stable exercise and then to a dynamic unstable exercise so this is how you can you one way you can progress exercises so an example of a static stable exercise would be this hands elevated push-up where you're everything's static stable and you're just moving in a push-up position right and then you can change that and progress that to a regular push-up where you're lowering down and then dropping your knees to press up so it's a little bit easier on the push-up part. And then we work towards doing a regular push-up. And then from there, we, would, we could also eventually lift the feet and do feet elevated push-ups. So then going to a static and unstable. So we're doing a dumbbell bench press here. So we've got a static position with our back on a bench, but we have unstable equipment where we have to balance dumbbells, right? Then, that, then we can change that into using a barbell with a floor press to make it a little bit easier, and then moving that barbell floor press into a dumbbell floor press where it's less stable, static and unstable, where our back's on the ground. And then we go to a dynamic stable exercise. And here we have a push up that's more dynamic and explosive, right? And then we can move that and develop, you know, develop that progression further with feet elevated and different things like that. So when we build a program, it's kind of a day by day, month by month progression. We often will work in, four to six week training blocks where we work on similar things for that four to six week block. Let's say we're trying to build muscular endurance. So we would work for four to six weeks building that, that phase for, for our strength part of our program. When we go, talk about progressing exercises and progressing training loads, that basically we manipulate the volume and the intensity of, of those exercises to help progress the athlete through their program. So how can we increase volume and progress so we can increase the weight uh, that we use or the load, we can increase the number of reps, we can increase the number of sets, we can increase 
number of exercises, we can decrease the speed of contraction or, time, or increase the time under tension. So there's a variety of different ways that we can manipulate a program to have an athlete progress as they go along through it. And then we talk about the Goldilocks principle. So, so with this, it's, you know, is, is the bed too hard? Is the bed too soft or is it just right? And, and when, we, when we talk about our training program, if you look at this graph, it kind of shows you where if you have a training stimulus, so if you go at the very you know, left side of the, that graph where it says training stimulus, and you, and you then, that's your workout. If you fatigue your body and don't allow it to recover fully before your next training session, so that red line, you can see that your, your fitness level really hasn't changed too much. Whereas if you apply a training stimulus and it's not that much of a stimulus, it's pretty easy workout, you can recover quicker and be ahead of the game a little bit, but if you don't have your next training session at the right time, then you're staying at your baseline. And then finally, what we wanna have is a, an optimal stimulus where we fatigue and stress the body. And then we get to that point where it says super compensation. And that's really where we wanna train again, right? We don't wanna let those, those gains or results drop off back to our baseline. So, so it's important to understand that the reason that we have a certain number of days per week for strength training, for example, is to allow you to fully recover to super compensate and actually get stronger. So again, you can see it on this next graph that when you look at changing and changing training loads per week and the likelihood of injury, as you increase the load, the inc there's an increased chance of injury. But if you find that sweet spot, right? So over time, if we progress the program week by week period, you can see that it's, you're more likely to get into that sweet spot of when to train again and reduce our, reduce our risk of injury by being in the right short-term to long-term workload ratio. Okay, so when we talk about chronic workload or acute workload, we look at acute as the past seven days of workload and chronic is closer to the past 30 days. So we want to have a good balance within that. So if you look at, you know, what just popped up on the screen there where it says the last three weeks, 45 kilometers or approximately 15 kilometers per week. What is the upcoming or the fourth week going to look like? How many kilometers should you run? And in terms of the acute workload of 30 kilometers and the chronic of 15, your ratio is two to zero, which would put you in a you know, danger zone or increased risk of injury, which is what we're trying to avoid when we plan out our training programs. So if we did look at as, you know, 22 kilometers acute, 15 kilometers chronic, the numbers keep dropping. And then, and finally, when we get into 18 kilometers in that one week and the chronic of 15 kilometers over the three weeks, then our ratio is in a sweet spot or decreased risk of injury. And that's what we're trying to accomplish there when we talk about progressing our program. So it's more about baby steps than it is about trying to jump from one kilometer to two kilometers to three kilometers day after day after day. We wanna make those jumps more weekly so, so we're better able to progress and develop without causing injury. So this is how we work on proper progressions. Number eight, incorporate testing, monitoring, and tracking. So, you know, Jeff just talked all about progressions and, and trying to determine what type of loads you can handle and how if you progress too quickly, uh, you might you might get at, be at a risk of injury. So a really important component of knowing where you're at uh, is to actually test where you're at and to incorporate daily monitoring and daily, daily tracking. So what 
what do you test if you're if you're an athlete or if you're a coach if you're a parent and, and you want to know what what should i be testing those athletic abilities that we went over at the start of the presentation are great places to start aerobic tests and anaerobic tests and speed tests strength tests depending on your sport we had mentioned how certain sports utilize some of these ath athletic abilities a little bit more than others so even within these abilities there's many tests we won't go through the different tests I and mean, we can talk lots on positives and, and negatives of certain tests and, and why, you know, some tests might be more, more important for your sport in particular. But, you know, this is just kind of a summary of what we can, what we can test and what you likely should be testing as an athlete. The other question we sometimes get is what's the point of testing? Why, why do I really need to test or monitor? Well, oftentimes when we, you know, start a strength conditioning program, we're going to do some form of testing. And, and the point here is to, Number one, determine areas of weakness. So you want to address those abilities that might be holding you back as an athlete. Uh, you know, when we're doing team testing, uh, sometimes there's, you know, a few athletes that might need to work in this area and, and some other athletes that might, you know, need uh, more work in a different area. When we test, it also is going to let us set more appropriate workloads and intensities. You know, if we want you, Jeff had mentioned how if we're doing hypertrophy or if we're doing strength or power, you know, you need to, you don't want to be at necessarily your max strength, right? You want to actually maybe bring your weight down a little bit uh, so that train for power, you can train for muscular endurance or hypertrophy. So having an idea of where you're at is important for setting those workloads and intensities. Follow-up testing is really important just from the basis of Am I improving? Is my program actually working or am I regressing? Am, am I losing some of my speed or some of my aerobic uh, uh, endurance, right? Um, accountability. Uh, if you know there's going to be testing upcoming, it's going to probably, you're going to put a little bit more effort into your strength conditioning program because you want to make sure you beat your score. So incorporating tests, especially as a coach, can be really good to, to hold your athletes accountable. And then finally, especially from a monitoring standpoint, it's going to indicate how you're actually managing your training loads uh, and your stress. And when we try to train or compete in an overtrained state, we're at a greater likelihood of developing illnesses and colds. Uh, you know, we're tired and really important to monitor uh, training. And, and an effective monitoring system can provide important feedback that's going to assist in the planning and periodization of your training. And the goal here, uh, you know, Jeff mentioned how we need good progressions, not only exercise progression, but also progressing the training load uh, that you do as an athlete. All of these are really important to, to optimize the effectiveness of your program, but also to avoid injury. Okay, so what do we monitor and why? Uh, you know, there's two loads that you can likely monitor as an athlete, and we, we monitor with our athletes kind of behind the scenes. Uh, one is external load. So you want to know your external load because you want to be able to understand how much work or what your training load actually was and what the, what your capabilities are as an athlete. Um, so some example is just uh, your volume. So how much weight did you lift? Our team builder program, you want to track your weights, right? You want to see how, whether you're progressing or regressing, um, whether you're hitting those, those reps that are you know, prescribed to you, your power output and your speed is an example of your external load. Um, and just understanding what your scores on the various tests are all examples of external load. Your internal load uh, is important in determining the appropriate stimulus for, for adaptation, right? So uh, your perceived effort or perceived level of exertion, uh, your sleep, your psychomotor speed, um, your resting heart rate, all can be uh, examples of internal load. And, and when you think internal, how is your body actually handling the training uh, and the training environment? Uh, when it comes to psychomotor and speed and speed and reaction type monitoring tests, uh, a 10 meter sprint, a 20 meter sprint, a vertical jump. These are very simple tests. Uh, they take, you know, seconds to complete and you can start to see trends, right? Is your vertical jump dropping? Is your sprint time? Are you getting a little bit slower? Um, you know, it's, it's, it can be marginal, but it can, you know, provide some insight into us as strength conditioning coaches, whether you're heading, headed in the right direction, maybe we need to tone it back a little bit. You know, so, so monitoring tests are important. Some of the tests we do, uh, especially with the athletes and, and the hockey athletes that come with us uh, or train with us four or five times a week, uh, we're, we're incorporating, uh, you know, these types of tests and we're, 
or getting them to fill out a quick survey just on their sleep and their perceived effort and weighing in and weighing out. So we can get a bit of an idea. So, I mean, these are three, uh, you know, examples incorporated into your, uh, into your training program. A few of the other uh, tools we have here at the center, and um, certainly if you're a pro provincial athlete listening on the call or provincial coach, uh, reach out to us because we, we work with you know, all sports and we can adapt a lot of the tests. Um, in the top left here, we have a team polar heart rate monitoring set. You can see as an athlete uh, you know, where your heart rate's at. Uh, it's also a GPS, so it's going to determine you know, the distance you ran. Really important for measuring that external load. How many kilometers are you uh, running during a soccer game or a rugby game? And, and we've gone out to a few practices and it's, uh, it's actually surprising how, how, much, uh, how much all the athletes here run. But, um, you know, so just an example there, uh, Hawk and Dynamics, we have force plates. Uh, again, makes the jump test very simple. Get an idea of, of asymmetries as well. Our gym awares look at movement velocity. Um, you know, so getting athletes to move at a certain speed they're moving the bar too slowly maybe they need to take weight off they move it to the speed to require uh, and then team builders are online programming so that's where you can track your weight you can track your movement velocities you can indicate whether you're hitting the right reps or if you need to go up or down so um, you know again really important to record uh, your weights just from a standpoint of tracking your progress and again seeing if you're you're progressing or regressing so again, testing, it's, it can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet, right? Just trying to get charts, understanding where you're at as an athlete, what direction you're moving in. The big thing is that we have consistent protocols and that you do testing or evaluations during multiple time points. And, and certainly if you're an athlete here and you'd like to uh, do a little testing and, and or do some force plate jumps or do, do some 10 meter sprints, a lot of the times these, these tests are actually probably incorporated into your program and you might not even know it, but um, it's something that you can look back at and get a bit of an idea of uh, if you're headed in the right, right directions. All right, next we're going to talk about picking your peaks. So as an athlete, you're often going to, depending on what type of sport you're in, you're going to have major competitions throughout the year. And when it comes to strength and conditioning, our goal is to really try to plan out your training program so we hit the peaks at the same time you want to hit your peaks and your major competition. So periodization is just the systematic planning of athletic or physical training. And the aim is to reach the best possible performance in the most important competitions of the year. So it involves progressive cycling of various aspects of a training program during a specific period. So if you look at this graph here, you'll see that there's volume and intensity and, and performance on the left hand side and you'll see that the volume is higher early and then it starts to drop down as intensity increases and then our performance which is more of a sport based skill and technical type of type of area is that's where we want to hit our peak when we hit that competition right so so we have different seasons throughout the year uh, pre-season or prep preparation or preparatory phases pre-competition competition and then rejuvenation or recovery which is is kind of an active recovery this could be playoffs this could be um, world championships could be national championships whatever whatever sport you're in everyone's got a little bit of a different different schedule and timing um, but it's really important that you understand that you can't you can't be at 100 percent and be at your best year round there's going to be times where you've got to build and there's going to be times where you've got to pull back and do something a little bit different or work more on technical aspects or work more on explosive power or things like that and that's where we have to change volume and intensity and those types of things so if we look at this tennis example of the ATP Tour, so that's men's, men's tennis, professional. They've got four major tournaments. And when most elite players focus on those tournaments, right? So they have other tournaments that they go to throughout the year to lead into those major tournaments, but they don't necessarily peak for those those smaller tournaments, their goal is to be at their best for those majors because that's where they get the most points uh, and that's where they can really 
honestly win the most money. So uh, at the end of the day for them, that as a professional tennis player, that's, that's really what their goal is. So again, looking at these different areas, you'll see that there's four different majors and there's different times where volume and intensity and, and performance all kind of weave through each other. So there's different gaps throughout the year where you're able to maybe work on building in between certain tournaments where there's more of a three week gap or four week gap between tournaments. And in majors, sometimes there's going to be four to six or eight weeks gap between those, those major tournaments or longer. Right. So, so there's time to build, and you can see some of these graphs where you see the one in the middle where that second second major competition is. There's a couple different phases within that where you can change your volume and manipulate it and then move play in a few tournaments and then do it again and then do it again. So there's, there's lots of different peaks and valleys within that training year. So what might you peak for? You could be peaking for tryouts, certain camps, playoffs, national championships, Canada games. And typically, you know, you want to do no more than two to four peaks throughout throughout a, a yearly training plan. <clears throat> so peaking and tapering oftentimes means reducing volume. So there's lots of different books out there about periodization and planning and tapering and, and those types of things and the best ways to go about doing that. Obviously, if you're working with, you're working with strength and conditioning coaches and your sport coaches and nutritionists and mental skills coaches and all those things, which, which we, we also work with um, to help athletes peak for their competitions. You can't peak for all competitions and expect to develop into a good athlete. Like you can't, if you, if you play in 20 tennis tournaments throughout this, throughout the year, you're not going to be able to be at your best for all of those. That's really, really difficult to do, but you do want to pick that provincial championship or that national championship as something you peak for and really, really focus on. And those other ones, although they're important, they don't matter as much because that's not what your goal is. Your goal is to peak for that national or international tournament, right? So we want to make sure that as we pick our peaks, that we're picking the right ones that meet our needs and also are realistic for us to peak for. And as a result, I mean, consistency is necessary as you're always competing. Uh, you're not going to necessarily develop some of those uh, abilities that, that can be really enhanced off the court and, or off the field or off the ice. And um, when you think of that long-term development plan, I mean, the big thing to remember is it's not a race uh, to, you know, win as many tournaments as possible. It's a, it's a plan. And, and that resource that we indicated at the start of the presentation kind of shows some of these training to competition type ratios uh, that you can uh, you can go through as an athlete so when when it comes to strength and conditioning i mean consistency is necessary and a lot of questions we often get we'll we'll see athletes that'll spend a summer training with us and you know they don't do the right things during their actual season in regards to to strength and conditioning so you know a question we'll sometimes get is how fast do i actually lose uh, the strength uh, that i've developed and, and we don't want athletes kind of regressing and, and starting back at square one. So just a kind of few few studies here. You know, this study looked at just a leg press exercise and how does uh, muscular strength change, you know, after people suddenly stop uh, training. The study found that strength levels can be maintained for up to two weeks. A study with rugby players uh, found that there was a about a 15% uh, reduction in strength over seven weeks. So think of that, in two months you're losing 15% of your strength. Another important point, uh, they found strength levels can kind of be maintained for up to three weeks of detraining, but after that, you're going to see, you know, significant e increases in, in uh, the loss of strength uh, or your muscle mass, um, you know, from weeks five to 16. So when Jeff just mentioned about peaking, you're always competing and you're avoiding strength conditioning uh, to some extent, uh, you know, after three weeks, you're going to start seeing those losses in strength. 
This study looked at volleyball athletes, looked at a 16-week uh, strength and conditioning and plyometric training program followed by a detraining period. And they found after those 16 weeks, so you think four months, that's a that's semester uh, when it comes to school, you know, if you're not doing those strength and conditioning, you're going to return to those base, baseline values after around 16 weeks. And, and you know, all that effort you put in, uh, you're losing you're losing some of those uh, motor performance parameters. This is with uh, world-class kayakers. They train for 43 weeks. So you can think almost a full year. They stopped training for five, five weeks. They noticed a 8% you know, drop in strength. Okay. When it comes to endurance, it's the same thing. When it, what happens when, when you stop, when you train for four to eight weeks, you suddenly stop for two to four, your VO2 max drops, you know, three and a half to 6%. If you're a highly trained individual, uh, and you stop training for four weeks, you're seeing a four to 14% drop. So the more you gain, the more you can drop. And what, what happens when you stop doing conditioning work in particular, when you do endurance or stamina training, your goal is to increase the ability to utilize oxygen, to increase your oxygen uptake. When you train, that happens. When you stop training, your ability to utilize oxygen is reduced. Uh, you increase your blood volume during training it's reduced during uh, when you stop training. Uh, you decrease your heart rate at a set intensity. Your perceived effort, uh, it decreases, right? It becomes easier. We talked about 10 to 20% or, you know, three, 14%. You know, it seems kind of confusing, right? Like how much is that actually? Does it really make that, that much of a difference? I'm assuming some of, the, some of the athletes on this call are gonna be preparing for Niagara. When we look back at the summer games in Winnipeg there in 2017, how much of a 10 to 20% difference uh, does it make? We won gold medals, a swimming 100, 100 meter freestyle, a female canoe kayak, uh, athletics, rowing, uh, won gold. So when you actually look at the results, 3% difference, canoe kayak, 1.5%. We don't get a medal if that's the case. You know, when it comes to 400 meter sprint, 2.5%. Rowing, 3.1%. When we see these numbers of, oh, you lose 4 to 14%, if you stop for a few few weeks, might not seem like a lot, but it makes a big difference when that margin or the differences between you know, winning medals and, and not winning medals, when that's so, so small, these little inches and these percentages, and, and they really do make a difference. And then team sports, a little bit harder to kind of quantify, but the idea being that these percentages add up and, and if we're not consistent with our strength training, the effects of losing strength and losing power factors in. So, uh, you know, to summarize kind of this point, consistency in training and strength conditioning, it's necessary. You can start losing some of those strength adaptations after two to three weeks of detraining. And, and we don't want to go back to our baselines. We work so hard to build our strength up and to increase our, our speed and our power and to work on all those athletic abilities. Partial or complete loss of endurance adaptations are going to happen in three to four weeks. So then the question is, how much do I actually need to maintain? When athletes say, you know, I don't have time to work out, it doesn't take a lot uh, to try to, to, to maintain some of those attributes and abilities you gain during the course of your program. Try to incorporate, even if you're out of your strength conditioning, you know, off-season training program, still try to squeeze in at least two resistance training sessions per week at a, at a good to moderate intensity. It might just be four exercises, three to five reps, or sorry, three to five sets, four to six reps, at kind of the higher intensity. That's gonna help you maintain your strength. Power and, and plyometrics, you know, once a week, right, right? once every five to eight days were some of the recommendations that came out of that study. So again, doesn't need to be as frequent, but something that you shouldn't suddenly just immediately stop because the season's begun or because you're you're going on a vacation or for some for some other reason. So. So one thing just to add to that, when, when you're talking about a lot of these different things and it's tougher to do during your actual competitive season, you can incorporate a lot of these different physical attributes you want to develop into your warmups, right? So we talked about warmups previously. And so, for example, if we wanted to incorporate some plyometrics into, into what we did and, and get better and more explosive, we could just simply finish our warm up with a, let's say, for example, a vertical power potentiation and then do 
two to three plyometric drills where we worked on that before we went on the ice or on the court or on the field. And we could do that multiple times a week with different skills we want to work on. So whether that's linear speed or lateral speed, quickness and agility or a leg power, we could do that and you can incorporate some of that training within your own warmups to actually make a make those warmups more beneficial and B develop continue to develop some of these qualities that we want to build on. And that's it. That's uh, 10, 10 considerations. Hopefully, hopefully everybody got some important take homes and just to summarize what those 10 points were, right? Ensuring your program is balanced, that you're incorporating sim single limb work or free weights, uh, that you're sticking to the right sets, reps and tempo, that you're allowing for recovery, that you're incorporating mobility, that you're warming up with intent, that you're progressing properly through your strength conditioning program, you're incorporating testing and monitoring, you're picking your peaks, you're periodizing appropriately, and that finally consistency is key. Hopefully everybody on the call picked up something new. Uh, certainly reach out to us at performance at sportmanitoba.ca if you have any questions or if you need help getting started with a strength conditioning program. Uh, have a great day everyone and good afternoon or good night.